Apologies on interrupting your regularly broadcasted programs, but quick announcement. So uh, this video is actually going to be a two-parter. It was originally supposed to be like 50 tips in 10 minutes, but there was just no way I was going to get 50 tips out with any kind of explanation and have it within 10 minutes. So the, the edit kind of came out to like 35 minutes or so, and that's still too long for me. So I'm going to try to break it up into master classes, if you will. This first one that you're watching right now will be more of a beginning crash course 101 filmmaking 101, so to speak. The second part is going to be more intermediate, even some advanced techniques, but I didn't go too deep into stuff just because I was trying to fit 50 tips in 10 minutes when I was originally filming it. So the second part will be a little more in depth and more for people who are trying to pursue filmmaking as a full-time job. Like I said in the video, anyone of any level could get value out of this video. At least that's my hope. And again, comment below if you do, but without any further ado, Let's get into the video. C stands, let's start with those. First, you want righty tighty, lefty loosey. You want, when you're tightening something, you want it to be going on the right side. So when you're putting weight on the top, it tightens instead of loosens when it pushes forward. Also, you wanna store it. So the gobo heads, that's these, are uh, towards the right, and the knobs on the actual C stand are on the left. There's three different types of C stand legs. There's the standard, there's the turtle head, which you could take off of the actual stand, put a light in here as a kicker, or you know, however you wanna use this. You can also have this kind of Rocky Mountain style leg, where if you're on a step or something and you wanna have it be even, you can adjust this length of this leg, tighten it back down, and now you can put it in more you know, hard to balance places. There's also combo stands. There's the smallest, most cheapest combo stands. The point of these are the weight is distributed a little higher in the stand up here instead of down here. So you can put a little more weight, it's a little more sturdy. They go from this size all the way up to a mambo combo, which you can use a menace arm or whatnot. I'm not getting into that this video, but just, you know, no. When you're doing the weight, always sand, bag, dirt, whatever you call it, put it on the tallest leg and also have your weight. So whatever light, if you're hanging something over, have that on the tallest leg. So weight over the tallest leg and bag the tallest leg. That's C stance, crash course. So what is an aperture? Well, that is, you see those blades in there? I'm not sure if this is coming through, but it is a number that is given to assign how much light is hitting your sensor. A f-stop, the lower the number, the more light, the wider it is open that is hitting your sensor. So think of a 2.8 versus a 4, you're getting more light. Now in turn, what that also incorporates is the lower the number, the softer or shallower depth of field you will have. So you will have more leeway with a lens that is at a 5.6 by moving in and out and keeping that in focus versus if it was at a 1.2 or a 2 because there's more shallow depth of field because there's more light hitting the sensor. So a T-stop is the actual technical measurement of the light coming in, taking the, into consideration what the F-stop is hitting the sensor. So you'll see on cinema lenses, T-stops. There's really not like a difference between the two as far as like if you're gonna use a lens that has an F-stop or a T-stop, just T-stops are more scientifically accurate to what the amount of light is hitting your lens. Quick rundown of sensors. You have Super 16 or 16 millimeter, Super 35 millimeter, large format, full frame, 65 millimeter, and then IMAX. Cliff notes, the larger the sensor, the finer the grain, the larger shallow depth of field, and all around, it feels a little more cinematic. You get the separation between the character and the background. But when you actually look at the list of movies that have been made, the majority of Hollywood movies have been shot on a Super 35 camera. So unless you are in the position where you're deciding, you know, you have like $100,000 to spend, don't get bogged down on, oh no, my camera's only a Super 35 sensor. 
it's fine. Movies will continue to be shot on this format and you will be fine. It's a nice medium between having, you know, a smaller format and a larger format. It's right in the middle and, you know, it's great. Dynamic range. It is a measurement of the blackest blacks and the whitest whites in your frame. So think shadows, highlights. The better the dynamic range, the more close it will be to our eyes, which will also give the more cinematic look. A camera that has really bad dynamic range will have to choose either to be in the shadows or the highlights. Think, you know, an iPhone or an iPod. A movie camera like an Alexa has really nice high dynamic range will make everything look just more realistic and in turn will be better. Dynamic range is a super important item to have in your kit as far as like a good camera, but if you light properly, you can get away with it and you don't need this crazy, you know, 22 steps of dynamic latitude. Bouncing light to get a softer image. Now bounce you can use in a few different ways. You can take a light like this key light over here and I could put like a little white board over here. And what this will do is this light will come over here, hit this white and then bounce to fill in my, my darkness in a more smooth way. Another way you can use bounce is a bookend light which you would blast a light through diffusion into a ultra bounce or a, you know a bead board, whatever you have and then bounce it through another set of diffusion and it gives a very soft, even lighting. Bounce is a really good way if you have time to give a more natural, less sourcey light and it's something you should definitely invest into your kit. Fusion's super important. There's different types of diffusion, but just when you think of diffusion, it just takes the light, softens it, makes it more even, makes it more angelic, right? Think of a sunny day versus a cloudy day. The diffused light is much more soft. You should definitely have diffusion in your kit, either a soft box or a frame. Let's finish up with neg fill. What is neg fill? Neg fill is the same as bounce, but with shadows. We want to add contrast to you know, talk about the dynamic range. So what you do in the same situation is I would have a neg flag, a black square, four by four, whatever. And I'd put it here, and if I moved it into frame, it will darken my face. It will add more contrast, and it will make it look more cinematic. Another thing to play piggyback off of that is shooting onto the dark side of the face. You look through all film, for the most part, a lot of times to make your shots look more cinematic, they'll always have the camera on the dark side of the face. If I was over here and I was looking like this, you know, looking out to this way, if I was doing an interview versus if I looking off to this way and doing an interview and hello, talking. This side looks a little more dynamic because you got the dark. I don't know if it's dark because it's light, but ideally you'd have the dark over here coming over into the light and it adds a little more dynamic look. So neg fill is something that's super important that takes your videos and makes it a little more dynamic, especially for narrative or more serious pieces when you're not just blasting light into it like a, you know, like a makeup commercial. Hazers, what are they used for and should you have it in the kit? Yes, I think you should have a hazer. Now you might not need a huge hazer like I have. You can just use a little spray bottle, but what it does is it adds dynamic weight to your scene. If you haze a room and then you have light going through it, it gives weight it gives physical, you know, look to your light beams. Right now, there's no weight in this, right? If we had haze going through this room. Now you look at the room now and there's more weight to it, you know? Obviously, it doesn't really fit the scene too well and, you know, you can't, you can really tell up here, but you can't really tell much other. And, you know, we're just talking, but you get the idea. Boom poles, how to hold them. I don't have a mic on here, but just pretend there's a mic. A lot of people just kind of hold them like this, you know, like fishing uh, fishing poles or whatnot, you know, or they'll do this. It's not the best way to hold it. So what you want to do is if you're booming, you know, and sound design people out there, crucify me if I'm doing it wrong, but how I was taught, you want to hold it up like this. Be very gentle because any kind of movement, you're going to get little micro sounds in the pole if you tap it or whatnot onto the mic. You can also rest it on your shoulders if you're doing a long take, but ideally you want to hold it up and above and then just angle it between the two people who are talking if you're doing a dialogue scene or just over the person who's going and who's talking. You don't want to hit the pole. You don't want to shake the pole. You don't want to hold like this, a boom pole holder. This is a little claw thing when you're doing any kind of interviews. Definitely invest yourself in one of these. Then look at, boom, now the boom pole is just out of way. Editing, the flesh line. When you're doing color on the chart, there is a line and that tells you what flesh color should be. 
when you are editing, you wanna use the flesh line to get perfect color for any human skin. Gaff tape and paper tape. What's the difference? Well, gaff tape is this really great, awesome, and if you're ever doing any second AC work, you're gonna have a lot of colors because you need one for every character. But the gist is, it is a very nice, multi-versatile, I'm actually using it right now to hold my mic. You can use it by, you know, sticking it in a ball and then sticking it underneath the picture if you're getting some glare. That's a really good nifty way to use tape. Uh, you use it for markers. This is a really crappy marker, but you'd put it down like that. Now the person knows, boom, that's where we go. You can also do an X. Little tip, gaff tape. The best way to use it and reuse it is when you take it, you take your finger, you go down, you fold it over so you're making kind of a corner, push your finger down, rip it, and then you have something when you put it down, a little tab because you did it from the piece before to pull up, but also it's easy to just pull another one and then do the same thing. Do it on a bigger one, it's a little easier to see. See that, we got a, we got a corner right there and then you can just rip it off, Ooh. and then boom ready to pull. So that's gaff tape. Paper tape is the same. You've used it if you've ever painted the house. It's just what you use when you don't wanna take any kind of varnish off of someone's house. If you're at someone's house or a location where you don't wanna have any damages, use paper tape when you need to. But gaff tape is you know, an essential for any film set. If you don't have some, get some. This is a fluid head. This is a 75 millimeter bowl. What it does is it allows you to get, when you loosen it, nice, slow and balanced pans and tilts this one is over there you go pans and tilts okay how you balance them there's numbers on the bottom this is not a good example because it has these dials on the sides but there's usually bottom and then they'll be here and there'll be numbers what you do is you have to twist the numbers to kind of get your weight back and forth the idea is whatever direction you leave your camera forward backwards it stays in that position it doesn't move forward and doesn't slip back anymore so you don't have to have it constantly locked down when you want to stop the camera fluid heads are a necessity and an early purchase if you're getting into film you can get a cheap benro to start off but fluid heads are necessities what is room tone going back to the mic room tone is a silent take of audio in whatever room or area that you are. It doesn't have to be in a room, it can be outside. You have a 10 to 30 second sound check where everyone is silent who is in the room, is in the room staying because, you know, as crazy as it sounds, if you have 20 people in a room and then you take those people out and you do a room tone, it's gonna sound a little off. And then you get that, so when the edit is happening, you can cut that in and you don't have those weird pops when you make an, a weird edit. Gels, and they're never gonna get phased out because gels are better than LEDs when it comes to color accuracy, but you wanna get, when you hear someone say CTO or CTB, that's color temperature orange, blue, or color temperature orange. Here's an example of a kit, magenta and green for magenta shifts, but what you get is you get orange, you get blue, and then there's half stops, quarter stops. You use those to get your color temperature Right, these are gels that are more for effects. They're effect gels. And the same thing, you put them in front of your light. That's without it, and that's with it. But just know that LEDs are not better than gels, they're just more convenient than gels. Holding a camera and weighing down the camera. Now, a lot of people think that having a rig that's really light is important, and that can come in handy sometimes, but you wanna have weight that gives you stability. So, when I'm holding the camera and it's really light, my body is always gonna have micro jitter. You can work on that and make it better, but they'll just be there. The more weight, it smooths out those micro jitters because there's a little more heft to your hand. But when you wanna hold a camera, especially when you're doing handheld, you wanna try to have three points of contact. So one here, one here, one here. That's gonna reduce the amount of jitters. It's gonna reduce the amount of movement. And when you do make moves, it's gonna be much smoother than kind of like wobbly. Two points are, you know, Pretty easy when you're moving around, you might not be able to keep it tight to yourselves, but one is only when you're moving really slow. The less points of contact you have, the more careful and steady you need to be attentive to your camera. Big rig, put it on your shoulder. You got one point of contact, two, three. So three points of contact is really important when you're doing any kind of work with the camera, at least two. How to wrap a cable. What is important is the over-under. Not every cable needs over-under, but it's good just to do. Go over, twist, under. 
over, twist, under. Some cables are just over, 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 but for the most part, over, under is the best. And that releases tension in your camera cables or your stingers, and they will have longer lives. So just remember, remove your SDI cables, your BNC cables before you power off or on any kind of equipment. It's important because then you're gonna have to pay like $500 to fix your SDI cables or the port, I should say. ADR, what is that? That is if you're in a room and in post, you make your talent come in and re-record their lines. Maybe there was some sound that was bad. Maybe there was, you know, one of the mics were not in a right place and it sounds, you know, kind of crappy. Additional dialogue recording. Foley is when I add that. If that was fake, if that wasn't really a noise and I put that in post, that would be a sound. Maybe crankling this. It is all the sounds around the scene that you add to make it better. In my last video, the steps going up the stairs, opening, closing the door, that was Foley that I added into the video afterwards. Think of it for when you're doing any kind of ads. Adding Foley will make your video that much better. We talked about this earlier, but bag everything. Have sandbags. There's a company called Lead Wake. It's for wake. Boarding. You know, you put it in the back of your boat to give it weight. It's really cheap. It's really well made. I highly recommend getting these bags. Uh, I think you get a 35 pound bag for $53. You're not gonna get if you're gonna buy like a Matthews bag or whatnot. They're super small and this is the 10 pound one, but the other ones are pretty small. Get bags, they're a necessity. Weight down, bag everything. You don't want lights falling on anyone. Okay, so that was the end of this video. As I said in the beginning, this is a two-part series. Next week is gonna be focusing more on techniques, so onset jargon, lighting techniques, understand how to create a more cinematic look, things like that. So stay tuned for that, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Also, comment below if there's anything you want me to go more into depth or what was a tip that you found interesting. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.